Hi, and welcome to the Sunday School Breakdown. I'm your host, I'm Wilman Murphy, and I'm one of the Sunday School teachers here at the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. We are located at 2870 Headland Drive, and that's in East Point, Georgia, the 303, the 4, and the 4. Our senior pastor is the Reverend Dr. Clayton Eugene Taylor Sr. And our co-pastor is the Reverend Christopher E. Taylor Sr. And guys, you know what? Collectively, we bring you greetings and good tidings from the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church family. Oh yes, we do indeed welcome you to another edition of the Sunday School Breakdown. Oh yes, this is the world's most unique Sunday School experience bar none, also known as the SSBD. We thank you dearly and severely. I appreciate you watching last week's lesson and the lesson before that. I think they were pretty good, right? What do you think? But I want you to do me a favor. Please call your friends, your family members, your co-workers, and just let them know that the Sunday School Breakdown, oh yes, it's about to go down. Guys, this is a good lesson. Yes, I said that last week and the week before that and possibly the week before that and so on and so on and so on. But this is a good lesson. It really is. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Freedom from sin. It's our first Sunday lesson. The first Sunday in May. Wow, time is flying by. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, the prayer in hands. This is the first Sunday. On first Sundays, we recite the Lord's Prayer. And I want you to mean it. Pray this prayer. Okay? Feel it. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed would be thine name. Let thine kingdom come, let thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Lord lead us not unto temptation, but please, please, please deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and forever and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. That is a great prayer. And it's always appropriate. Ah, oh, the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. There she is. The church is open for your spiritual business. Or if you just need to phone a friend. Facebook Live. Also, simultaneously, it's being aired on YouTube. That's the channel. 10 o'clock each Sunday mornings. Meet me at the Paul. You get to choose virtually or physically. It's your decision. <laughs> I'm feeling silly. <laughs> Guys, we're in Unit 3. Liberating letters. The word liberate, once again, means to what? To set free. To be made free. These are letters. So our letter is coming from the Apostle Paul. An epistle. It is. 
And yes, this is indeed critical Bible theory, which simply means is that you must accept it. As a Christian, you must, you must, you must believe on this lesson. And in the practice that Jesus did, you must accept it wholeheartedly. And no one should be able to separate you from your God and from his word. Remember the word infrangible. Cannot be divided. Cannot be separated. Obedient to the word of God. In this lesson, we're going to talk about in Romans 6, 1 through 14. Now, last week's lesson, when I saw that it was going to be 14 verses. I was saying, whoa, that's too many verses to take care of in our allotted time. But guess what happened? I'm going to add four more verses because there are four verses that needs to be done for our introduction. And then the other 14 and that truly the part of the lesson we will go through those very quickly. Because the Apostle Paul is saying the same thing throughout each verse, but people understand that different ways. And obviously, Paul understood that. So he would give the same message, but just change a word or two to be able to capture people at that place of understanding. That's what a good teacher should do. <laughs> okay. For this lesson, I'm going to pull out my little black book. And oh yes, my little black book, it has lots of names and lots of numbers. In fact, that's a whole book in my little black book that's called Numbers. So we're going to start in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, for our introduction. Should flow right about there. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And then verse 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is writing to the Roman, to the believers, to the saints to the Christians. In verse 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. In verse 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul is praying for the believers, the converts in Rome, the new Christians. Paul is praying that these converts will stick to the gospel, the word of God. Now, into the official lesson. 
Romans 6, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul was talking to the Romans, which most of the time consisted of a lot of Gentiles. They in Rome, not in Jerusalem. So a lot of the Greek people, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, were here. And Paul was talking to those Christians, those converts, the Jews and the Gentiles, and he was telling them about Christ, about what God had done by the resurrection of Christ. And Paul was saying this is critical Bible theory. You must believe. You see, each one of us, there was a before and an after. And if your after doesn't look better than your before, then you need to check your spirit odometer. So what Paul was trying to get the people to understand that God had made a way through the blood of Jesus through the death and the resurrection of Jesus that he had made a way for you to be forgiven of your sin. But Paul didn't want to get it confused. He didn't want people to think just because that was a way of being forgiven for your sin that you should just automatically commit more sin in order to be forgiven more. People were beginning to quantify the practice of forgiveness. Verse one, what shall we then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? People actually asked Paul, should we continue to be sinners, hoping, anticipating that God will give us more grace? He didn't want them to get it twisted. This is a rhetorical question. Paul didn't want them to get it twisted in their minds and in their spirits that more sin equates to more grace. Now that happens, but we don't want to play with our God and with our lives. So Paul is simply saying, guys, don't play with this thing. No. See, there should have been a conversion before and the after. So don't play with this. Not necessarily more sin equals more grace. This should not be intentional. And verse 2, following along with that, God forbid. Paul is saying, don't think like that. God forbid you to have that type of mindset. No, 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 no. That is not the proper thinking. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul is saying, you see, once you accepted Christ and you got into the baptism pool, once the water overcame you, you died to your sin. And when you came up, you came up a new creature in Christ. There's a before and an after. 
You went down one way. You were submerged one way. You were emerged another way. You went down. There should have been a transformation going on, not just physically, but more importantly, spiritually. And verse three, and know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Paul is saying, Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Jesus, guys, believe this critical Bible theory. Jesus really did. Really, really, really did. Jesus died. No questions about it. It wasn't a pretend death. It wasn't a play death, a fake death. Jesus genuinely, truly died. Put your faith in Jesus. In verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him by the baptism into death. When Jesus died physically, when we were baptized into his name, well, symbolically, we died as well. The old you were buried as you went into the water. You die. But just like Jesus got up, well, 4B, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, well, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. When the Father raised Jesus up, he gave Jesus a new walk. He gave Jesus a new life, a resurrected life, because once again, Jesus truly had died. But when his father raised him back up from the grave, well, we were raised from a watery grave, as Brother Marvin is demonstrating here. And no, I don't know if his name really is Marvin. It, it just came to my mind. His name, we're going to call him Marvin. So Brother Marvin is demonstrating. And if you look at his face, you can see that a change has taken place. A transformation has taken place. And therefore, he has a new walk. There's a newness in his step. He can walk blindly now. Because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is leading him. Let God show you the way. You too have a new walk. You have a new step. Once you are baptized, you're supposed to have a new you. 
Life should change. The things you were doing before should not continue into the future. The new normal. And that is a life in Christ. And verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, the teacher Paul, the apostle Paul, the saint Paul. Wait a minute. Isn't that the name of our church? Saint Paul? So Paul is telling us that once you are planted together with Christ, so once a seed has been made for you, you expect something to come out of the seed. You are expected to flourish. God planted a seed and we went down with Christ planted together in the likeness of his death. So therefore, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We were drawn at death. So when God raised him up from death, we should still be joined in the resurrection. The new life. The new you. The new me. Gosh, you know Jesus really did die. You got to believe it. Verses 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The old man, the before, is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. In verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. You see, when we were planted, that was mentioned in verse 5, with Christ, we took on the same symbolically punishment that Christ took on. In fact, Christ was crucified on the cross for our sins. So the old man was crucified. The old you. Christ took that to a Roman cross. We were crucified with him. Our sins. And I told you a couple of weeks ago. The Easter lesson. I added some stripes. to the body of Christ. Yes, I did. So I truly was crucified with the Father. My stripes were there. Did you add in the stripes to the body of a crucified Christ? And he did this so that sin might be destroyed. That old man died on that cross. It should be over. The deal is over. Christ sealed the deal. Look at the end of verse 6. That henceforth we should not serve sin any longer. See, if you died to sin, well, if you're dead, you're not sinning. Verse 7. Why? For he that is dead is freed from sin. 
once we die symbolically with Christ, well, we weren't sinning because that old man died and dead man tell no lies and a dead man cannot sin. That dead man that was crucified is free from the sin. Now our challenge is to be able to stay that way. To leave the old man behind. And once God resurrected Christ, we're supposed to still have left that old man dead. And the new man thrive in an alive Christ. In verse 8. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ. Christ. And as Brother Marvin is illustrating, the old man died with Christ. And the benefit of dying symbolically with Christ is that spiritually and physically today, we can also live with Christ. After all, Christ isn't dead anymore. You guys remember? In three days, he got up. But the mere fact that Jesus died, that completed the process. Therefore, we can live because he lives and we can face tomorrow. Why? Because he lives. In verse 9, moving right along. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Christ died. But because of his death, Christ overcame death. Christ overpowered death. Death no longer has dominion over Christ. Therefore, you should not fear death. What we tend to fear is not having life. And look at the way it was explained in verse 9. I love this. Knowing that Christ was raised from the dead, he dieth no more. Which means what Christ did was complete and final. God allowed Christ to complete the process. Christ sealed the deal. Christ took on the sins of you and the sins of me. You see, in the Old Testament ways, an animal had to be sacrificed to atone for sin. I don't know about you, but I do. 
know about me. I would have had to become a sheep farmer in order to have enough animals to sacrifice for my sins. But once Christ did it on the cross, it was final. The grand finale. And it's no longer needed to be repeated. Christ did it right the first time. And there's no need for him to die again. The price was paid for the atonement of sin for sins that happened before Christ. Sins that are still happening after Christ. Children that haven't even been born. Their sins have already been atoned. The price has already been paid. There's no need for Christ to come and die again for the children that are born in 2022. Well, over 2,000 years ago when Christ died, he died for those that was already dead. He died for those that yet to be born. It was final. Once again, that deal has been sealed. But you need to believe upon it. You need to believe that death has no more dominion over Christ. He got up. He conquered the grave. He conquered death itself. So we don't have to be afraid to die. What we're afraid of is not having life because God has made a better plan, a better way for us. We just hate to miss out on life. Or is that just me? In verse 10, for that end he died. Yes, he did die. He died unto sin once, uno, one time only. It was only necessary once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Which means that Christ meet me at the wall. Christ he really died. But once he died, he conquered Satan. You see the last part of verse 10, it says, he liveth unto the Father, unto God. What that means is that now he's been raised up and liveth unto God. But when he died, he conquered Satan, the adversary of God. He died unto sin. The author of sin is Satan. He conquered Satan. And he doesn't have to die anymore. You have a way out. But you must believe. You must accept his death and his resurrection critical Bible theory and verse 11 likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin symbolically we are going through the steps of Christ so reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto your sin. 
but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ defeated the grim reaper. Therefore, we don't have to fear death. It's been conquered. It's been paid for. The price is already paid in full. We just need to accept it. Believe it to be the gospel, the good news. It's freedom to serve God. You see, once you have died and detached yourselves from sin, well, now you are free to serve a living Christ, an ever living God. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, your physical mortal body. Mortal simply is a body that's corruptible, a body that can die, a mortal body. That ye should obey it in the lust there are. You should not obey it in the lust there are. Which means the flesh. Those fleshly temptations. As our mortal bodies walk about. There are going to be storms trials and tribulations that we're going to have to walk through on a daily basis. But we need to put our faith in Jesus to help us walk through the shadows of death. We got to focus. We got to stay prayed up to be able to fight the challenges. After all, though it's a battle, the battle really isn't yours. It is indeed. You're right, I heard you say it. I heard you say it. It is indeed the Lord's. And verse 13. Now the year your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Paul is really keeping it real. Paul is saying, don't let the members of your body, the members of your mortal body, a corruptible body, do not let the body parts, your hands, your eyes, your feet, your legs, your mouth, become unrighteous. Don't yield to those unrighteousness. Don't allow your mind to think unrighteous things. Don't yield, but allow your mind to focus, to concentrate on the righteousness of God. Easier said than done. Now I'm saying this as a true fact for me. I know you guys are better than I am. After all, I am the weakest link. 
So we need to concentrate. We need to pray a lot. As a matter of fact, we need to pray. I need to pray without ceasing. Keep our mind stayed on Jesus. Put your faith in him. Temptation will come. We're not supposed to allow it to overtake us. Use your instruments, your mouth, your hands, your arms, your feet, your eyes. Use your mind as instruments of God. That's what it means to live holy. In verse 14. For sin shall not be dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but you live under God's grace. Your bodies, those instruments, as you're running this race, once again, keep your minds stayed on him and you will have the victory it mentions the law you see the law is the old testament the mosaic laws everyone was going to come up short of Fulfilling the laws. Those laws were put in place as a reminder that we could not fulfill them. Those laws were put in place to remind us that we were sinners. Those laws were put in place to remind us that we needed a savior. Well, accepting Christ as your Lord, your master, your savior. You're not governed by the laws. The law. You're governed now by grace. The grace of God through his son, Jesus the Christ. This is what victory looks like. This is what an overcomer looks like. And we are all overcomers. Believe in Jesus. Put your faith in him. He's already paid the price for you and for me. And I tell you guys, I really, 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 I really do love the Lord and I'm sure that you do as well and guys you know what that's our lesson for this week that's that that's all Folks, I 
And we'll close with one of the short prayers that found in our lesson planner. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your grace that made clear to us through your Son, Jesus to Christ. May we be encouraged and strengthened to live for you each and every day. We ask things in the name of Jesus, by whose blood we have been set free and made new, our new normal. Amen. Amen and amen. Next week's lesson, we're still in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. Lesson 10. Wow, going by so quickly. Freedom for the future. We're talking about freedom, being liberated. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get out of here. Come on, cue up the music, somebody. Oh yes, thank you for this lesson. Thank you for this session. I do appreciate you dearly. I am your host. I'm Wilma Murphy. And I want you to do me a favor until next week. I pray and ask that you be blessed. Be safe. And guys, by all means, remain encouraged. Yes, be thankful. Yes. And always, always, always remain grateful. I am indeed grateful for you. You all have a good night. See you next week.